same thing here. So we're going to start off with you guys telling a little bit about yourself. I want to hear your history because what really enticed me about this panel was how different everybody's background was. You know, again, same thing with the first panel. Not everybody is born into brewing. So I want to know where you guys were, how you got here, and uh, you know the business of, of, of brewing. So Curtis, let's start with you. This thing on? Yeah. yeah. Cool. So, so I am uh, actually an attorney by trade and started homegrown just because I'm kind of a nerd and wanted a hobby. And I started homegrown with my neighbor and really fell in love with it. Joined the homegrown club and before we knew it, it went from just kind of a hobby to a passion. And so I think one night after probably one too many beers, we decided that we wanted to try to open up a brewery. My business partner actually wanted to open a sports bar. I knew that wasn't a good idea, so we settled on a, uh, on a brewery, and that was you know, four years or so ago. Ed? Hey there, uh, my name is Ed Marzuski, and I'm a successful failure. <laughs> I've been involved in a lot of different activities within the cultural fields of art and activism. Uh, I'm a director of a nonprofit organization that runs a gallery space for the past 12 years. I've been involved in the arts for a couple of decades, but I've also been a bar baby. My, I was, my family, my father had a tavern, a little village in Chicago. My mother purchased a bar in Bridgeport. Uh, back in the day, we used to call Bridgeport the community of the future, if the future was the apocalypse. <laughs> But now, Bridgeport actually is a place where I live and work, and it's been my goal in the last 15, 20 years to actually make that Southside neighborhood a real community of the future uh, through the activities that we're involved in, which includes a family bar, a Korean-Polish uh, street food restaurant, and of course, Mars Community Brewing, the brewery that I'm here representing today as a co-founder and president. So to me, brewing is one of the most exciting places you can be in to help transform a neighborhood, a local culture, into something that benefits us all in the face of a monopolistic, capitalist society that you guys help reinforce and create. Dick? It was really uh, well done. And I, you know, I noticed that you were reading from the teleprompter. Yeah. <laughs>
being a business owner, being your own boss? You know, that was the scary part. Um, you know, again, I think it's really easy to, to look and say, I can make a good beer. That, that's that's going to be fun. But um, I think actually the much more rewarding part of that process was thinking about, well, if we're going to quit our jobs, and we're all pretty happy with what we're doing. We have health care that someone else is administering that we don't have to like figure out ourselves as a small business. Um, you know, someone else is running the payroll. We don't need to figure that out. Someone else is fixing the copy machine. That's not my job. Um, so, you know, jumping into a small business is, is kind of scary for those reasons. But I think the rewarding part is actually thinking about if you're going to start a business and start a company, you know, that's putting something out into the world. And so, you know, what are those values? Um, you know, our brand at Hopewell, we like to think that we're really clean and bright and modern. We like to think our peers are that way. We kind of try to keep our, our company values that same way. We try to pay people as best we can. Um, you know, we try to uh, empower people, give them you know, roles that they want to grow with, and give them room to grow. Uh, in two and a half years, we've had one staff member leave and no other turnover. So it's, 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 been, a, it's been a good team to, to grow with. And that's, you know, it's very impressive because, especially in, in Bruins, there's so much turnover. And uh, what I find fascinating is that you convince people of your dream and they jumped on board. Was that the most difficult part or what was the most difficult part of Hopewell? Oh, the most difficult part was in convincing people that, that this would be fun is convincing the bank, I think. <laughs> I mean, there's three of us uh, partners. Um, we were all under 30 when we started. Uh, you know, we were all doing well in our careers. But like, what else do we have to offer? So convincing the bank and a good amount of equity investment to start up this business. You guys all know it's not cheap. There's a lot of a lot of uh, stainless steel that goes into a brewery. It's all expensive stuff. So that, I think that was the biggest hurdle. Now, and Dick, for you, when you came back to your brother, Jake, and, and said, hey, I want in, what was the reaction? Did he, did he, was it a natural acceptance, or was there any kind of rejection, or did he question you? Well, we were fairly small at the time, uh, about 80,000 barrels a year, <laughs> which, I mean, at the time was, was small. I mean, remember, our beer back then was just called Mining Cookies. It wasn't competing in this micro or craft segment, which is a much higher price today. So we were competing against, at that time, Old Style, Paps, Schmitz, some of the other legacy breweries in the United States. And we were making literally pennies on the case. So we were a closely held, family-run, family-owned company. So to bring another family member into the business was not an easy decision. It went to the board. Now, the board made up of family members. And I can tell you that it was not a unanimous decision to bring another home to me into the business. But I proved my work in a year because I went and called on a gentleman named Mitch Odo, who was the buyer for a drugstore chain here in Chicago called Osco Drug. And Osco and Walgreen at the time were the two biggest beer sellers in the city. Osco had 100, and Walgreen had 135 stores. I got Mitch to buy both our Mining Googles and Mining Googles Light, and we sold 50,000 cases, which doubled our business in 1987. So it was a smart investment by the family. <laughs> so how do you convince him to, to buy this small brewery, beer from the small brewery up in the middle of Wisconsin, in the north woods of Wisconsin? So at that time he had had Augsburg. And Augsburg was kind of this big specialty beer. Burbaugh was just coming in at the time. But, you know, Mitch was a student. He, he was looking at what was happening in the beer business and he knew he could get 25 cents more a six pack for these beers than Miller, Bud, and the other Stroh and other bigger breweries at the time. So it took me six months to convince him, but eventually the way I did it was I made it his decision. I made him the hero. I said, Mitch, if you bring in Lighting Google, just think what it's going to do for your business. You'll be the first guy to bring in Lighting Google into Chicago in a big way. And uh, that's how I was able to do it. Now, Ed, Ed, Matthew, you do 
bring up any barriers for me to get engaged in this particular thing. We were a bunch of home brewers as well and pro brewers. I was the weakest link in the entire organization. I'm really a bad brewer, but I managed to be able to facilitate a bunch of projects. And this brewery is an incredible project in the fact that we're a bunch of nobodies that everyone is expecting and hoping would fail. We're competing against a marketplace that grew from like three or four breweries to 200 in a few years. And now we kick everybody's ass in terms of how good our beer is and how we present our brand to the entire planet. And that is a great feeling to right? There's a kind of collegiate atmosphere where we collaborate and love each other and we're all pretending that we're pals like me and Dick. But the reality is we want our beer to destroy everyone else's. And we do. So that's a great feeling. And I think that's why I'm here today to share with you the fact that Mars Community Brewing is some of the best beer brewed in this country. Curtis, I don't know how you're going to follow such a modest. Uh, <laughs> you, Curtis, you, you were in politics. Was it? Right? You were you're in city politics. And I don't know, man. Can I interrupt you? Because the fact that a brewer is also running as an aldermanic candidate, state representative candidate here in Chicago, is a testament to how important our industry is. We have a brewer who's also going to be a representative of the people of Chicago and the state of Illinois. And I can't wait to hear a rep, man. Yeah, this is super important. So, I mean, I'm not saying that, that politics are very safe, but I mean, that's, that's one trajectory, and you decided to go over here. How did you get people to, I mean, besides just being a, not the greatest home but how did you get people to believe in what you want to do and, and get them on board and, and do what you're doing? So as far as the group, yeah. um, I have a group of guys who have breakfast every six weeks. This is good. And so, you know, I really just pitched them initially. I just said, hey, look, you guys have been over to the house. We've been in the We kind of want to take this to a different level. Will you chip in you know, a few bucks? I went to friends and family. Only friends actually support them. So, Just a small cycle system, which allowed us to. Bring 
startup, the true entrepreneurial Chicago DIY, do it together, hard scramble way, right? So that's what Chicago's great for. You can do anything you want in the city. So be, beyond that particular startup project, we started looking for other spaces. And once again, you hit the barrier of the permitting and licensing issues. And had I known at the time, I would have hired a lawyer who knew a bunch of expediters to make sure this thing would go away. And my lesson, I'm sure everyone in the audience knows, is that hire a good attorney with an expediter. But yeah, I mean, really, it's a challenge. And it's about basically your desire, your kind of passion you have for any industry, beer, cider, food, global uh, financial manipulation of markets. If you are passionate about it, you will be able to kick ass. And you have a great base of our city of Chicago to be able to do anything, any project. And that's why I think we're able to succeed. The, the city of Chicago, despite having these barriers, once you get past them, you've already been through the worst, you can make anything happen. Now, Dick, you have a brewery in the middle of the Northwoods of Wisconsin. How do you get people outside of there? And you did an excellent job with Oscar at first, but what made it, well, your family, how did they know that they wanted to expand? Did they want to expand? Was that something that was in part of the original plan, or was it, did you want to just open a small brewery for this town and just keep it to stand? How did you get from there to where you are now? The 70s was an interesting time because my dad was literally in survival mode. Most of the small family-owned breweries were going out of business in the United States. And I think one of the things that he did was he actually raised price during that time period. And he also went and worked with his distributors to say, I want to be your local brewery. So local back then meant 75 mile radius of Chippewa Falls. We're gonna keep that area strong. We're gonna, when you come up here, you know that you're gonna be a mighty country. Yeah. And we, we were lucky. Um, a lot of you folks would vacation in Wisconsin. And you would come up to your cabins or the resorts in northern Wisconsin, and you would discover this beer, Mining Kugel's beer, you couldn't buy it in Illinois, and you would bring back returnable cases, returnable bottles, and then you would try to redeem it back at your local foremost liquor store, and they would say, I can't take that because you don't sell Mining Kugel's here in the state of Illinois. But you would discover the beer up there, and, and that's really, literally, how we got able, being able to expand was people coming to northern Wisconsin, tasting this beer, loving it while they were on vacation, and then bringing it back home. So there's an interesting story because there's a brewery in Wisconsin today that is actually larger than we are in Wisconsin, called New Glarus. That's only available in Wisconsin. I would venture 25% of their sales come from outside of Wisconsin, whether it's Minnesota, Michigan, Illinois. And you look at some of their largest distribution points, Woodman's in Kenosha, Woodman's in Hawaii, Chaconi Liquors in Hudson, Wisconsin, other liquor stores in Superior, and near the UP, so they trade off the fact of scarcity, and in many ways, that's how we were able to stay in business, to get to the point where we hit upon a product like Mighty Google Summer Shandy in 2006 that takes us into national distribution. That was the first national distribution. Can I, can I add, though, that... Of course you can. One of the, one of the issues, though, that you have as an advantage of a small a brewer yeah. is that you are, you are owned by Miller Coors, where you have a national, international footprint and distribution network. That's right. For guys like us, we have self-distribution companies that we start to distribute our own beer. We don't, we're not, even if we launched the beautiful Shandy, we would not have the ability to scale up and be able to market and present that beer at the Walgreens and Costco's of the U.S. through our network. So in a way, the, the being a legacy 70s awesome brewery, and Lineys were like the jam, right? Your, your, your position 
in the market is much different than what's happening in craft beer in general. The majority of craft beer is about two to 5,000 small breweries like our size, working our particular markets in our neighborhoods, right? And it's breweries that are owned by the Miller Coors and the AB InBev's of the world that would like us to just stay in our little neighborhood corners. Well, there, there's a balance. I'll interject on this. There's got to be a balance. There can't be all AB, Miller Coors. There can't be all neighborhood breweries. There's got to be a balance. And I think as we move forward, it's it's growing and there's going to be a balance. There's always going to be some that balance it out. So, you know, more than just focusing on craft beer, like I want to give the stories of beer in general. And every, again, whether you're craft beer, you're owned by a, a beer course, everybody's got a story and everybody's starting somewhere. So, and if it wasn't for larger distribution networks too, things would be offset and changed. But uh, right now I want to focus more on stories that you guys present. I'm oh, sorry for I'm sorry for doing that. No, I think no, maybe I'm a little biased because the state level is really distribution, three tier system of Illinois, I think is more of an issue than just uh, like larger schools. And that like if you look at some California like words of scale and selling what they want to sell, I mean they have the ability to sell the shoe up to sixty thousand you just barrels or so. You have we have up to seventy five hundred.
plays. Um, and just to rewind real quick, are you, is everyone familiar with this kind of distri distribution discussion? So after Prohibition in this country, um, we ended up with three different tiers. Obviously highly regulated alcohol industry, so we've got suppliers, brewers, we've got distributors or wholesalers, and then we've got retailers. Um, if you're really small, like uh, Ed, I think you, you don't sell to We used to. Okay, you used to. So if you're, if you're really small in Illinois, you can actually kind of play in all three tiers. Um, if you're larger, you kind of get out of that exception and kind of only play in one. So when we opened Hopewell, we decided to be ambitious and try to run our separate businesses. We are running the tap. We're running our self-distribution business, which means we had really awesome van where the door didn't lock, the AC didn't work, the heat didn't work, but it did drive up to 45 miles an hour. Um, and we loaded up with kegs and distributed kegs to the bars all around town. Um, we were draft only, which meant that our primary package was a keg, um, which meant that no one got to see our shiny brand anywhere unless they were really lucky and close to the bar and they saw a tap handle. Um, so the tap room was important to us. It was kind of our only expression of what Hopewell is.